Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Big Tech, Market Power, and Democracy. I'd like to welcome Juliana to the stage to introduce our next panel. Okay, thank you. Well, good morning for to some of you and good afternoon to the others. It is a great pleasure to be here with amazing professors, researchers, and people that I admire. I am Juliana Dominguez, Professor of Economic Law at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And I am also the leader of the Competition and Innovation Research Group from the University of Sao Paulo. Um, I am also a coordinator of uh, the Radical Exchange Brazilian chapter. I am glad to be part of the Radical Exchange community. Last year, I was a speaker during the conference and this year, I am so happy to be the moderator of the antitrust discussion. And as we have several issues concerning the effects of the technological revolution on the democratic process that are putting the antitrust standards in check, I have proposed this panel, okay? Uh, I am happy, in fact, I am very happy to moderate this incredible panel for several reasons. First of all, I want to thank Radical Exchange in the name of Matt and Glenn for giving this space to me uh, and also believing in the creation of the Brazilian chapter. We have a fantastic academic group working with Radical Exchange proposals in Brazil since 2019. And as explained before, uh, each one of our speakers will have around 10 minutes to present. And after that, the audience can ask some questions, okay? Uh, during the panel, the idea is to have an open, free and great discussion. So now I want to introduce our speakers, okay? We have here Magali Aben. She joined the University of Glasgow as a lecturer in competition, but previously she was at the University of Leeds during the time she was finishing her PhD. Megali was in 2018 an American Bar Association's Antitrust Law International Scholar in Residence. She was a visiting researcher at Georgetown University when I met her. She has taught competition policy summer classes at the London School of Economics and besides, I think that I should mention that she is the co-director of Ascola UK chapter. Ascola is the Academic Society for Competition Law. We also have here Chibo Schrepel. He is an assistant professor in European Economic Law at the Utrecht University School of Law and the faculty associate at Harvard University's Berkman Center. He holds uh, research and teaching positions at the University of uh, Paris one, Paris sounds really weird, right? Paris one, uh, Pantheon Sorbonne and Sciences. He has a website with his name and his work related to blockchain can be found at blockchainantitrust.com. I also would like to mention that his most recent article was co-authorate with uh, Vitalik Buterin that was also a speaker during this conference. And we also have here Joanna Marinesco. She is an assistant professor at UPenn School of Social Policy and Practice. She is an economist who studies the labor market to craft new policies. And Professor Marinesco's research expertise includes online job search, antitrust and the labor markets, the universal basic income, unemployment insurance and minimal wage. Her research uh, was mentioned in many uh, medias, including New York Times, CNN, the Wall Street Journal. And it is an opportunity to mention that I've won a prize in Brazil uh, using Glenn Posner, Joana, and Hovenkamp ideas. I don't know if uh, she knows that. Uh, to start, and even knowing that almost everyone knows it, I would like to explain to uh, the main audience that the dominance of big techs raises a series of concerns in connection with uh, their market power. But as we may discuss today, designing the right policies and remedies, it is a challenge. And we, in fact, I think that we may consider if new policies and remedies are essential. And I believe that this panel will bring different perspectives to everyone, right? 
So I think that 50 minutes is not enough for us to cover all the main issues related to this panel topic. So it is better to start with Megali Aben. Please, Megali, you can go ahead and thank you again for accepting Redco Exchange invitation. Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, as uh, Juliana said, my name is Magali. I am uh, very happy to be here. Um, so what I want to do with my time is just put forward a few thoughts that I had, um, just listening to the different debates we have on the way we can look at big tech and, and at digital platforms and the way we can deal with them. So both in the US and the EU, quite similar debates are going on. Um, and what I keep coming back to is that the notion of relational power is actually quite important in those debates, but we're not spending enough time digging into what relational power is and what the source of relational power is. So just for some um, background, there is a difference between market power in absolute terms and relational power. Relational power is the idea um, of power in an individual relationship, whereas market power looks at the market as a whole. So you could say that a company has market power when it really has the ability to act independently of other market participants because it's not faced with significant rivalry, with significant competition in its own market. This is quite different from the idea of relational power. Relational power is the idea that two businesses might be in a commercial, a contractual relationship with each other, and there is an imbalance in power. One of those companies may have a significant more powerful position, a superior bargaining position, or other advantages, which give it the ability to impose certain onerous conditions on the other party. Now, that's an individual issue. It doesn't require looking at the market as a whole. And I actually think it's an interesting notion, the notion of relational power. Because if you think about it, it's gaining a lot more traction in debates about the power of big tech and platforms than market power is. Um, the idea of platform power, for example. So the idea that big tech companies operate platforms that other businesses use to contact consumers and market their products to consumers is a different one from market power. The notion there is that because you operate a platform that is used by a lot of businesses, you can impose onerous conditions on those businesses and you might actually make it harder for them to operate on their market. But that doesn't necessarily require any anti-competitive purpose to it. So I started thinking about this platform power issue and wondering what the relationship is with our competition law rules as they stand. Because most of the time, when we talk about competition law rules or antitrust law rules, we talk about rules where market power is a condition for the application of the rules rather than relational power. But relational power is actually quite a big opportunity. If we talk about relational power rather than market power, we can focus on the impact of big tech on economic democracy, on the participation of small businesses in the market rather than just the competitors of those big tech companies. So I started considering relational power and competition law, and it led me to looking at the laws of France and Germany and Japan. And I became quite fascinated because in those competition law jurisdictions, they use the notion of relational power. You don't necessarily need market power. You might have relational power and still be infringing the law. Of course, my immediate thought was, is there actually a difference in the impact relational power has on the market rather than market power. And I started realizing that there are two normative references, two normative foundations for the idea of relational power uh, being prohibited. And they are two very different normative foundations and I'm not sure that they work well together. So the first normative foundation is the idea that you need to prohibit the abuse of relational power the abuse of the power that one company has over another in order to ensure the economic principles of a competitive market system. So in those cases, relational power will be viewed generally as an indication of a wider concern with the ability of the market to lead to ideal economic outcomes. So these ideal economic outcomes could be things like efficiency or consumer welfare or a general idea of a competitive market. So that is the first normative foundation. You want an, a particular economic public good to be satisfied. 
Now, in those cases, relational power will only be a problem if it is an indication of a wider concern that the market isn't functioning properly and that you won't actually be able to achieve that ideal economic outcome. I think that is the most traditional way of viewing power and competition issues. But what is fascinating was that there was actually a second normative foundation in those systems. They looked at relational power as a way to safeguard economic actors, smaller and medium-sized enterprises from coercion by private power. They didn't do this because of some economic ideal. They did it because they wanted to protect economic democracy. They wanted to protect participation in the economy. And I found that really fascinating because in this idea, the rules of conduct on the market are designed out of a concern that the existence of private power will invade the rights and the action sphere necessary to guarantee a democratic market structure. Now, when we talk about democracy, we usually talk about it in terms of political notions, but here it's about economic democracy. It's the equality, the equal opportunities for entrepreneurs to access consumers, to be able to operate on a market. Now, this view thinks that you need economic democracy as a way to have social contentment overall. Um, and that one way of doing it is to safeguard economic actors from the abuse of relational power by other businesses. But although I found this really fascinating and really convincing, and I was immediately ready to go on the competition law for democracy train, I realized it doesn't work. You can't have a normative foundation that is about an economic ideal an economic public good such as efficiency and at the same time economic democracy. There is a tension between those frames of reference because both require a balancing. If you have a case of relational power, you will always balance the power of the allegedly powerful company, the rights that that company has to trade freely, to choose its own contract partners against those other interests. Now, those other interests could either be in the idea that you want to protect economic democracy, the interests of other market participants, of other businesses. But in the second normative frame, it isn't the interest of the other businesses, it's the interest of society as a whole to achieve a certain economic outcome that matters. And those two don't lead to the same outcomes. Those are two different foundations and two different exercises, and they lead to different results on a case-to-case -case basis. Now, there's a tension then between those two. And I started thinking about how this tension was resolved historically. If you look at the United States, antitrust law already seems to have made a choice throughout time to move from protecting the freedom of smaller traders to a bigger, more specific focus on economic efficiency. There is now a pushback to that, right? People are less convinced that we should be focusing on consumer welfare and efficiency, but it was a choice that was made and it was a logical choice in the sense that you can't have both. They're contradictory. The EU is worse because the EU tried to resolve this problem not in, not in a clear way, but by making a difference between the level of the union and the level of the member states. Now, this is historically quite interesting, um, but if you look at European Union, competition law until the early 2000s at an EU level really focused on efficiency of the union as a whole, welfare of the bloc as a whole. There were no redistributional concerns. It was about a particular economic ideal for the whole of the European Union. That left the space to the member states in purely national cases to actually do what they wanted with their own law. And indeed, quite a few countries adopted abuses of relational power because they cared about principles of economic democracy. So the tension was resolved until the beginning of the 2000s, when the European Union decided that the member states should implement both EU competition law and their own rules in the same cases. And if you look at the decisional practice, in my opinion, all hell broke loose, because it seems like it actually isn't clear whether you protect democracy or you protect efficiency in those particular cases. This is even worse now because the European Union from the 90s really moved from being a um, 
block focused on the welfare of the whole union to focusing on the population. There was an introduction of European Union citizenship into the EU framework. And as a result, there are actually more calls that the European Union doesn't just look at creating welfare for the union as a whole, but also at how that welfare is redistributed. If you add to that the discontentment we've seen in the last few years and the fear you sometimes hear that big tech might be getting in the way of democracy, it becomes less and less clear what the European Union is actually supposed to be doing with its competition policy. Now, in come the new rules on big tech. I don't know how many of you tried to follow the debate on the new legal proposals to deal with this sort of platform power or gatekeeping power or self-referencing, but um, it's a bit of a mess, right? So you read the proposals at EU level and at national level. Um, in the EU, for example, there is now a call to update the platform to business regulation, which only came into force last year, and update it in light of what they think isn't enough competition in the EU. But this actually, this discussion is really confused because they speak on the one hand about competitiveness and innovation, and on the other hand about fostering a level playing field, which will be good for the opportunities of entrepreneurs to enter the market. The same kind of discussions you hear in the US um, when you listen to the Senate subcommittee on competition, it is very confusing what they're actually trying to achieve. On the one hand, they're talking about innovation and efficiency. On the other hand, they're saying, really, you need to have equal opportunity for anyone to enter the market. Now, maybe we don't care. Maybe you will tell me, well, there's different objectives and that's always been the case. But I actually think this conflation of those two normative frames of reference mean we won't achieve anything. Because as I said, if you look at the case law of jurisdictions where they actually properly apply both, both frames of reference, both the idea of economic democracy and the idea of some kind of public economic good, they really struggle to apply both in the same case. And it becomes a purely case by case decision by the judges or enforcers. So I don't think you will achieve either democracy or efficiency by muddling all together in the same kind of principles. So I think sometimes of this um, idea or this quote or infamous quote by Easterbrook that if everything is relevant, nothing is this positive. And I think it becomes more and more important. So I wanna throw out and I wanna get some reflection on this, whether it might be worth actually creating a regulatory framework separate from antitrust law, separate from competition law that is explicitly about driving economic democracy and that we stop putting everything in the same basket and trying to reconcile different things, but we create a framework for economic democracy. In my view, that would be something to be implemented by the courts and not by an administrative authority, whilst competition law would stay with the administrative authorities. But anyway, in my 10 minutes, um, I hope I have broadly sketched what I think is an issue and I'd be really interested in having a proper debate about this. So thank you. Thank you, Magali. I think we must go ahead with Chibo now just to have an extra time to debate in the end, okay? All right. Um, so first of all, I'm really happy to be here, whatever it means in the, in the digital way, in the cyberspace with you. I'm also really happy to be in the minority today. I think it's, it's, it's great to be in the minority. And so congratulations for the organizers that. Um, so what I want to try to do is to, of course, um, look at the issue of big tech market power, but more from the perspective of uh, the technology versus the law. Um, and, and then I look forward as well to the discussion, uh, a few, a few uh, questions for, for Maggie as well. Um, so let me share my screen right now. All right, so if you can see my screen. So I have four points that I want to discuss and hopefully they will make sense with uh, one another. So the first is the idea of uh, populism. And I think it, is, it has become impossible, unfortunately, to discuss big tech 
the impact on democracy without mentioning populism and all the issues which are attached to populism. So before um, researching in the field and, and having a, a proper scientific look at populism, I thought, well, populism actually is not so bad. It means caring about the people. And after all, uh, of course, it's wonderful to have conferences and to have experts and lots of knowledge, but in the end, it should benefit the people. And then having a look at populism, I realized that it is not at all about protecting the people, but what populism is about is creating two groups or at least recognizing two different groups. And then to um, uh, make one of those two groups evil in, in, the, uh, in the mind of uh, every, everyone, therefore to ask power to actually be able to, to curve that evil and to potentially eliminate that evil. So of course, if I say populism, unfortunately in the US, I guess no one here would discuss that we see lots of populism, but things are not better in Europe. If you look at Europe more in, in the last four years, more than 25% uh, of the vote went for populist parties. So we do have that issue of populism in the US and in Europe. And of course, those are issues which are purely political in a sense. Um, and then I asked myself the question, well, do we have populism in our scientific debate? And actually the answer is quite easy to find. The, an the answer is given actually by some people which are discussing those issues of big tech and democracy and market power, and uh, including the Open Market Institute, for instance, where they actually wrote a paper saying, we are populist, but we are populist with brain. So I'm not sure if it means anything, Hopefully we could discuss that, but for one, one thing is for sure is that populism and the ID to say one is evil and we are the good people, therefore give us power, is something that we should keep in mind when we discuss democracy and uh, the power of big tech company. So that's the first point. And the second point is actually uh, directly linked to the first one. Uh, I think the idea of breaking up tech companies and big tech giants uh, directly steams from uh, the idea of populism uh, being uh, more and more uh, present in our uh, scientific debates. And the reason why I'm saying that is, is not because I can tell you that breaking up big tech companies is a mistake, because in fact, I have no idea. Maybe that will be a good thing, but I believe that it is impossible for anyone to be able to prove that breaking up big tech companies is actually a good thing, 100% sure. And so here's a few reasons why. The first is that, of course, when we discuss big tech companies, it used to be easier in the past for antitrust scholars to discuss uh, the, the power of, of big companies because the power was purely economic. And we see that this is not anymore the case with uh, big tech companies. Of course, they have an economic power, but they also have political power and they impact pretty much every field of our society. And we've seen with the COVID crisis that they impact everything we do on a daily basis in our life. So for that reason, it means that of course we need to look at the issue, but breaking up tech companies will need to imply economic analysis, legal analysis, sociology, philosophy, and, and of course to be able to measure the effect on billions of people across the globe. So I think for that, this is quite difficult to say the least. The second one, the second point is that if you were to break up tech companies, what you would do is that you would sacrifice some activities of those companies. Of course, we know that if we talk about Facebook, Google, Amazon, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to identify which activities are the one in which the company makes profits. However, we also know that those companies are developing new activities and for sometimes a certain number of years, they don't make any profit out of those activities. So if you were to break up tech companies, the sole fact of saying th this activity, which is yet non-profitable, is not part of the new entity, by definition, you will kill that entity, that uh, activity. And I'm not sure if anyone is well equipped to, to um, uh, proceed that way. Third is that, of course, tech companies are mutating. And so um, if you want to discuss what's the effect on, of the market on those companies, I think the end of the story should not be to say big tech companies exist for now 20 years. That's to prove that the market is not doing anything. 
Well, the true question should be, is the company the same that the company was 20 years ago? Is Amazon the same that Amazon was only five or 10 years ago? So I think this is an important question and I will come back to that. The fourth is the idea that if you were to break up tech companies, not for economic reason, but for other reasons, such as fake news, I am not convinced that uh, having new entities and lots of different entities competing in the market to capture your attention would mean that you will have less fake news that you have right now. Potentially that is the case, but not sure about this one. The fifth point, of course, that's the clash of the elites. It doesn't mean, of course, that we should not have a look at, at those tech companies. But I think it's very interesting to see that uh, antitrust authorities are now seeing those tech companies as a threat, not only to consumer welfare, to democracy, but also to, to their own political power. And I think the Libra example is a very good example of that. And the, the final point, and of course, I don't want to dive into this one too much, but we've heard a lot about those tech companies and we see the comparisons with uh, um, uh, the, the rising of the Nazi party. And you, you do have a great paper that was published a few months ago by uh, Dan Crane from Michigan University and uh, showing a link between um, uh, the, the support uh, to uh, Nazism uh, and, and, and the link between that and economic power. So this is something we should worry about. However, is also making the point that if we used antitrust law or competition law as it is today, uh, back in, in the late 30s, uh, the Nazi party will have been uh, uh, broken up and um, will, will not experience the same support from big tech companies or big companies at the time. So all of those issues, I think, uh, call for cautious in, in the way we uh, talk about the debates. And I think that issue is uh, actually more problematic than it seems, the fact that we are discussing so much whether or not we should break up tech companies. Because while we do that, there are real important issues that we are not talking about. And so I'll, I will briefly mention three of those issues. The first is the obsession with price. So if you follow the field of antitrust, you know, uh, of course, that the, the focus on prices were uh, something that the Chicago School was, was big about and uh, pretty much all about. The Chicago School was about to say, well, antitrust should actually maximize consumer welfare. And the best way to do that is to drive prices down. And to some degree, I think it was necessary back in the 70s. And I'm not sure if today discussing prices all the time is the thing that we should do. Indeed, if you have platforms and two-sided markets, and if the use of a platform is free for consumers, then to discuss prices all the time makes no sense. Otherwise, you will never see any consumer harm. So I think we need to, sh to shift that a little bit more to some other uh, uh, concepts. One could be innovation. Another one could be choice. And that's the one that the European Commission has chosen. If you go back to the three Google cases, to even the press release that was announced uh, this week or last week regarding Apple, the European Commission seems to, uh, to, to consider that the more choice, the better for consumer. I think it's a little bit more co complicated than that, but we need to discuss all of those issues. The second one, it's, and I believe that uh, it will be discussed right after me, it's the fact that antitrust has been obsessed with what's happening outside the firm. So uh, the, the very basic idea of antitrust is actually quite easy to understand. Of course, practices are being decided within the firm, and then the only thing that matters is whether the effect outside of the firm is negative for, and then it depends, consumer, democracy, any standard that you want. And I think it's a mistake not to have looked at the effect of practices within the firm. And for that reason, I think we should actually discuss the effects of a market structure and company practices within the firm, and especially against workers and all of the labor issue that will be discussed right after me, I think are issues that we need to discuss way more than we are doing right now, only focusing on what's happening outside of the firm. And the third point is the idea of uh, dynamisms and uh, the idea that competition agencies, most of the time, seems to work on one basis, which is taking a picture of the market 
as it is at the time of practices, and then working on the basis of that picture. And of course, life is not a picture. Markets are not pictures. They are fast moving movies. And for that reason, I think we need to change the tools when we discuss, for instance, the relevant markets. Um, we, we, we can't work on the basis of those pictures. We have to consider whether or not the market's moving, meaning in turn that we have to, to integrate the time issue in our antitrust analysis. And it will be especially relevant when it comes to big tech companies. And the, the final points of my talk, which is um, in my mind, at least the, the most central is uh, the idea of the relationship in the end between the law and technology. And so um, here I want to start on, on a basis which some people will discuss, but I found that probably five to 10 years ago, this was very controversial and it is not anymore. I think pretty much the majority of uh, experts and people uh, having a, look, a, a very precise look at uh, the effect of technology on our democracies will agree that technology is deterministic. What it means is that the state of technology and technological advancement is the actually the determined factor on our society. If technology gives power to people, to companies to do something, then it will change the way society is. And when we say that, we tend to discuss all the time the negative effects of that. And of course, there are plenty of negative effects creating by technology on our societies. But there are also some positive effects that technology could create on our societies. And so the reason why I have the logo of the, the radical um, on, on, the, on, the, on the right uh, and the thumbs up is that I think that uh, Radical uh, Exchange has made a great job as actually explaining how you could use technology to also create good in society. That's, for instance, the case of quadratic voting and other technologies. So tech is deterministic, but let's not only focus on the negative effects of technology, because if we do so, of course, we will regulate some practices that should be regulated. But the risk is that we will also destroy what technology is creative in a positive way for our societies. So this is a graph that I took from uh, the famous book uh, written by Albert Hirschman, Exit, Voice and Loyalty in, 70, in 79. And in that graph, you have uh, four groups of people in society and is making the point that some group of people can only voice, which is uh, basically ex expressing uh, disagreement or unhappiness. And some other group can only exit the group, which means they can leave the group um, and uh, they cannot actually voice against the group. And at the time, I very much believe that this was true. But if you have looked at the two blue bubbles, I think this is not true anymore and this is, partially due to technological advancements. Let me take, for instance, the one on the, on the top uh, right corner, family, tribe, nation, church, and so on. At the time, it was impossible to escape those. If you were born in a state, almost impossible to escape state regulation. If you were born, uh, if you were part of a certain tribe, almost impossible to escape as well. And I think now we can pretty much agree that being in the cyberspace mean that you will escape some system, some legal system to actually enter another legal system, or sometimes to enter a zone where the rule of law won't apply. I'm not saying this is a good thing, but potentially it could be used in some uh, countries, for instance, where you have a dictator and potentially tech could be uh, helping people to, to, to move towards freedom. And the other one, the other uh, blue bubble, uh, uh, left corner, Competition businesses enterprise in relation to customers. At the time, Hirschman wrote that for those, it was impossible to voice, meaning that if you were a consumer, the only thing you could do at the time was to use another product or to move to another company if you think that if you thought that the company or the product was not good, good enough for you. And now I think we can also pretty much agree that it is possible for consumers to voice. This is all of the website that we use to um, uh, basically say this restaurant was great, uh, this product uh, is not safe and so on. So you see that 
technology is creating new opportunities for some group to voice or to exit where at the time it was um, impossible to do one of those two. So in turn, technology creates good for society, not always, but we should not disregard the good that it is creating. So uh, to, to conclude, um, and this is indeed the, the paper that Juliana mentioned when introducing me, um, I, I wrote a paper recently, which is a, sh a short 10 pages paper with uh, Vitalik, who's the creator of the Ethereum, who gave the talk um, uh, regarding quadratic voting uh, in this conference. And in this paper, we make the point that, uh, of course, technology is creating some legal issues and we, sh we should not disregard those issues. But blockchain could also be used to complement antitrust in spaces where antitrust cannot apply for certain reason, either because some jurisdiction might be mutually unfriendly or because sometimes, as we know, the detection rate of anti-illegal practices is quite low. We estimate that uh, we can actually detect only 10% of illegal cartels being implemented. And there, technology could help as well. And so this is the very last slide. If you look at that from a pure game theory perspective, uh, I, I tried my best to make it very simple. Uh, the point that I want to make is that if you combine the law with the technology, potentially, and that's the outcome, which is on the, on the corner uh, on the right side, uh, potentially the outcome would be mutually beneficial for those two. As I said, the law, unfortunately, whether we like it or not, may not always apply. And sometimes technology, of course, will not organize society in the way which is the best way. But I think the, the corona crisis that we are going through is a very good uh, reminder of, of all that. And the fact that our technology are more and more present in our daily lives. And we always thought as lawyers that we should design the law as the ultimate constraint on society and that it has to curb everything else. And I think we see more and more that technology is also now becoming important in the way we organize society. And, and if we keep on creating laws that goes against technology all the time, disregarding what technology creates goods for society, I think that's a mistake and neither the law or the technology will actually benefit from that. Of course, we need to discuss what this collaboration mean. It means concessions on both sides, and it will be complicated to change minds of lawyers and developers that they have to consider one another. But I really think we have no choice but to go in that direction. And again, I look forward to the discussion and that, that was it for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bo. I was making several notes and then I saw that I am receiving several questions too from the audience. Uh, I think that we can uh, go ahead with Joanna and then let the questions for the end of this uh, panel, okay? Thank you. Your microphone is off. Uh, okay, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon uh, to those in Europe. I'm very happy to be here. And um, I'm the economist on this panel. And I want to talk to you about antitrust and the labor market. And I want to make sure that we have time for questions. So I apologize. I'm going to try to be quite brief, even if there would be much to discuss uh, about the empirical evidence that I'm going to try to summarize uh, in broad brushes. So um, the, oops, sorry, I'm having some technical difficulty here. Ah, uh, wait, apologies. Um, the problem is once I start sharing, uh, I wasn't able to, uh, um, you know, put my slides forward. So I apologize about that. I'll try again. Uh, okay, here. Problem, take your time. Share. Um, how do I, I'm so sorry. I don't know, like the slides don't move forward if I, if I share the screen at the same time. Uh, okay, you know what I'm gonna do because we don't have time. I'm gonna give up on the slides and talk to you without the slides. I look at them. It's okay, I'm gonna manage to get through the, uh, through the main points. So, okay, 
What I want to talk to you about then is about antitrust enforcement in the labor market. So much of antitrust uh, enforcement uh, in the US, essentially all of it concerns issues about the product market. However, the labor market is obviously a very important market as well. And there is almost no enforcement of labor uh, issues uh, along with antitrust. And I have a paper with Eric Posner in 2019 that discusses this litigation gap and why that might have occurred. However, that being said, recently there's been much more interest from competition authorities in the US uh, in labor antitrust. And that's partly because there's been slow wage growth since the last recession. And there's more interest in policies that could uh, increase wage growth. So one example that's linked to tech that uh, you know, is related to antitrust enforcement in the US by federal agencies, the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission is for example, a 2010 uh, lawsuit against the Silicon Valley no poach agreements. And this law lawsuit you know, uh, meant that the companies in Silicon Valley that agreed not to hire each other's workers ended up settling uh, because this uh, action was against the law. And there's a recent empirical paper by Gibson that shows that in fact, these no poach agreements did reduce the wages of workers that were affected. Um, so, you know, what can we do about this? One example is to strengthen a merger control by looking at potentially anti-competitive impacts on the labor market and the Federal Trade Commission as well as the, as the Department of Justice is interested in pursuing that. And I have a whole discussion of this uh, from a legal perspective in my paper with uh, Herb Hovenkamp from 2019. So let me uh, tell you briefly about how we go about in economics trying to assess whether there is a lack of competition in the labor market. So a key tool for doing that is what we call the labor supply elasticity. And this is a measure again of labor market competition. So what does that mean? I'm gonna talk about a simple example, which is what we call the quit elasticity. And that asks the question, okay, you have a job. Well, what if your employer was going to decrease your wage? How much of a wage decrease would you endure before you're gonna quit that job? And essentially, if you have low elasticity, it means you wouldn't react very much, which means that the employer could underpay you or cut your wage quite a bit before you would exit and go elsewhere. And so therefore, the lower the elasticity, meaning that people don't react much to changes in wages, and that lowers competition uh, in the labor market. And obviously, one of the reasons why elasticity could be low it are things like no poach agreement that we just talked about in the Silicon Valley where two companies say, hey, let's not hire each other's workers. Well, that limits you know, the number of competitors in that market that workers can access. Similarly, just if there are few competitors in a labor market, the labor market we say is highly concentrated, that similarly reduces workers' opportunities and will tend to lead to a lower elasticity, less competition and lower wages. So concretely, what do we know about, in reality, how competitive labor markets are? So I don't have time to go through the technicalities here, but essentially from economic theory, we can figure out a test for competition based on uh, this elasticity that I just talked about. And it turns out that in most jobs in the US, uh, the market is to sufficiently lacks competition that a monopsonist, meaning a firm that would become the only employer in that market, could profitably lower wages by 5%. So what you see in this graph is that the elasticity is below that red, uh, red line to the left of that red line, which means that those markets, uh, again, a monopsonist that would control those markets could lower wages. And you can see the diverse uh, occupations like telemarketers, customer service representatives, these are all the most common occupations in the US. So this is from a paper that I wrote with uh, uh, Jose Azar and Steve Berry. Now that's for key occupations in the US. Most of these occupations are you know, uh, not new tech uh, occupations, though some occupations are in tech, like uh, you know, computer support specialists, et cetera. So what about tech uh, areas? So for example, there's a paper looking at elasticities for Uber workers, and they are very similar to the kinds of results that we've seen here, implying that the market for ride share uh, could be monopsonized, that you know, there's the potential for wage suppression if there's a lack of, uh, of competition. 
On another big platform, Amazon Mechanical Turk, these labor supply elasticities are even lower, which means that the opportunity for underpaying workers is even much greater. And that's very interesting because in principle, a market like Amazon Mechanical Turk should allow workers to easily change jobs. But practically speaking, that's not what's happening. And workers are not very sensitive to wages, which means that requesters can um, have the opportunity to underpay people. Now, uh, I also want to show you a little bit more results about, well, in fact, do we seem to uh, see that markets that are less competitive are also markets where people get paid less? So I'm going to show you here a map of the US uh, where we measure labor market competition in different markets. And what you can see, there's lots of red. So the majority or 60% of US labor markets are highly concentrated, which su suggests that in many markets, uh, there is an opportunity for employers to suppress wages. And in fact, this is exactly what we find. We find that when labor market concentration within a market increases, then you also see that wages decrease. And um, this negative relationship between concentration and wages uh, is robust to many um, ways of looking at the data and have, has also been confirmed in uh, at least five other independent studies that use slightly different data and different analysis methods. But the big picture is that higher labor market concentration reduces wages. And another way of putting it is that if you have lower competition in the labor market, you actually do see uh, lower wages. So to conclude, uh, we see that there is, in fact, imperfect competition in the labor market so that uh, profit maximizing firms can pay workers less than their marginal productivity, which means, you know, the contribution of workers to the firm's value. And this is true both in the US in general for common jobs, as well as for ride sharing apps uh, and Amazon Mechanical Turk. So the majority of US labor markets are highly concentrated, meaning that there is an opportunity for employers to pay lower wages. And we also have shown that higher labor market concentration leads to lower wages. And in terms of regulation, this implies that mergers uh, should be looked at more carefully because there's also new research specifically looking at mergers and showing that a merger that does lead to a great increase in labor market concentration also decreases wages. And so uh, it is hopeful that currently labor market antitrust enforcement is strengthening in the US at the federal level uh, with actions by the Department of Justice as well as the Federal Trade Commission. So uh, I thank you very much. I apologize for the technical uh, difficulty. If you have any questions, um, you can uh, reach me on Twitter at M-I-O-A-N-A. -A, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Well, all the presentations were really good. And the bad thing is that we don't have enough time for, you know, go through the discussions here. Um, I received uh, some good questions from the audience. Some of them to everyone, I think that we should try to do something together and then try to, you know, address these questions here. Uh, unfortunately, we have come to the end of this incredible discussion, but uh, I am delighted and full of new ideas after listening to our incredible speakers. I want to thank you again and say that this topic will be one of the central issues after this pandemic of coronavirus, I think. Uh, and it's a pity that we just have two minutes. So that's why I'm going to give you space to add any other comment. And I am really glad to have you here. And I think it's a great opportunity to go ahead and try to do something together after this. Thank you. <laughs>